No problem. Cool. Um, the principle or the, the purpose of, of our discussion today is to look at ways of improving your cybersecurity posture. And in what we've done, uh, not fully understanding exactly what kind of what kind of audience we have, we've made we've identified six what we what we describe as the kind of critical areas uh, to help you prepare uh, your cybersecurity posture and improve improve your chances of keeping the hackers out because that's ultimately what the game what the what the goal is is uh, keeping intruders out of your networks and uh, and uh, essentially making sure that you maintain your operations uh, in the event of an attack. The the format of what we're going to cover today is broken into a couple of different sections. Uh, first of all, we're just going to sort of get an understanding of, of the type of people on the call today, um, some of the risks. We have a, a very short survey of just three questions, and it's completely anonymized, so you can feel free to be as, as honest as you wish. They're kind of yes, no answers anyway. Beyond that, we're going to look at a bit of the context of what's happening. An awful lot of the questions that we get asked is, how does this happen? Like, what, how do hackers work and how does the kind of... How does, how, do, how does ransomware come about? How does it happen? So we'll go through a little bit about that, explain to you the kind of vectors of attack that are out there. And that's kind of a gentle lead in to the six steps. And what we find out there an awful lot is that there's a lot of talk about technology, that technology is the answer. And while technology is part of the answer, and when I mean technology, I mean things like malware protection, firewalls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera and the different layers of technology and the different types of technology out there. These are critical, they're important, um, but there's steps before that that are even more important, again, um, in terms of assessing your own risk and how you go about establishing what your risk profile looks like. So we're gonna go through all that with you. Um, I'm guessing from the nature of the SME space in Ireland that we've got micro businesses right up to all different, all sorts of different sizes. So we've different recommendations for different sizes of business. The slideshow that's here today, there's recommendations within it. There's, there's recommendations for technology, there's recommendations for other types of stuff. We've also got a sample asset register and a sample risk register and some sample policies as well, uh, as well as the, the slideshow itself for download. And uh, we'll be sharing the link with you that with everyone afterwards. So without further ado, like most of the people that come on these, these webinars, we, 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 we have several of them, uh, come because they want to know more about cyber. Um, let me just minimize that there. They want to know a little bit more about cybersecurity. They want to know like well, what's going on out there. Um, an awful lot of people that we talk to don't even know where to begin. And part of what we're trying to get through today and part of the, the downloads that we're giving you today are a way to help you start assessing yourself um, against what's out there in terms of risk and that, uh, just getting together the, the brickwork that helps you prepare uh, your business, whether it's a three person organization or a hundred person organization, the process of assessing what you have is, is, is an important starting point. And then obviously what happens to the HSE sends an absolute shockwave um, throughout Irish business. Like within, within three weeks of that HSE event occurring, we've done 65 different assessments. Uh, now they were based on with, a, with our current client base, but also another 15 other clients or 15 other potential came to us saying, well, we, we don't know where to begin. And we help them assess their positions. So a lot of people are terrified and terrified isn't probably the emotion I'd be hoping for. Curious would be a better one. Um, curious with an action plan bolted onto the back of it, um, because being terrified doesn't get you anywhere. But being curious and, and with, with, a, with some form of action at the back of it is, is, will be much more helpful to yourselves. But the good news of what we're talking about today is that we're going to cover the basics. And I mean this in the most fundamental way. This is the basics. We've alluded to um, much more evolved, much more kind of uh, much more about, let's say, frameworks and security procedures uh, in the presentation. But generally speaking, I'm, I'm taking this that people know very little, um, and we're going to give you some tools to help you get started at the very minimum. Um, just some of the terminology that we use so we don't get lost. I'm going to be referring to this stuff as we go throughout. Uh, malware and ransomware. I think most people understand what malware is, but it, malware is really a blanket term used to, just, used to describe 
any piece of software that has malicious intent that's essentially going to bring down your network or a PC or create disruption. Um, and in that bucket falls ransomware, in that bucket falls Trojans, and uh, oh, there's that viruses, the whole shoot and match. Uh, ransomware, I think most people are, are familiar with it. And uh, when we talk about ransomware today, we're going to be talking about not just ransomware, which encrypts everything that it finds and makes essentially makes all your data unusable. But we're also going to talk about extortionware as well, which is another kind of variant of ransomware. And what that is, is it steals your data before it encrypts it. <laughs> so it's another layer of horror on top of what ransomware is already. Uh, firewalls, when I'm talking about firewalls, I don't mean firewall on your PC or on your Mac or on your devices. I mean a box that sits a reputable vendor box like a Sonic Wall or, or a Fortinet or a Sophos box that sits between you and your business and the internet and polices the traffic between those two networks. Uh, so, you know, that may not be applicable to everyone on the call today, but it should largely be applicable to any company with more than three or four people in the business. Uh, layered security is a term and you'll hear it. I, I put it in here for one reason, really. If you're negotiating with somebody after you get off this call, or you want to go back to your IT provider and you want to have a discussion with them, uh, you want to talk about layered because what layered is, is that if one part of your security infrastructure fails, there's another backup piece below it. So I'll give you a simple example. Imagine you had a, an email came in and you had email protection and an email came through with, with some kind of malware on it, but the email protection didn't get it. But what happened below that is that you'd hope that, your, that the protection on your PC would get it if it opened it up. So that's like layering. And sometimes you have multiple layers stacked on top of each other. But it's important that those layers um, communicate and talk to each other in a way that, uh, that's, uh, that's cohesive. So if you like, imagine you have like seven different solutions all talking all over the place, they don't talk to each other. So when you talk layered, or when we talk layered, we're really talking about kind of a cohesive approach to the layering, um, but I'll come to that later on. Um, security policies, standards, and frameworks, I could talk about this all day long, but I think it's really important and it's a really important starting point to, to define what good looks like. And you do that through policy. So a simple example would be to take something like a backup and you say, well, okay, well, if something happens, if my server blows up or if I lose data in my cloud platform or whatever the case may be, uh, how much data should I expect to lose? And how quickly should I be able to recover from that? So that's that's defining what good looks like for your business. So if you've got a highly transactional business doing, let's say thousands of transactions every hour, let's say an online, an online, like an online shop or something like that, obviously losing thousands of transactions every hour, you want to you want to minimize the amount of data loss that there is, but you define that through policy. Um, and there are policies for everything. There are policies for remote workers, for password protection, for all sorts of other things. And you can buy policy books online, um, full policy books from somewhere like IT Governance, which, which is referred to below in, in, the, uh, in the presentation itself. What standards and frameworks are are slightly different things because a standard is something that you achieve. It's something you get rubber stamped. So cybersecurity in, in the cybersecurity world, uh, at the, a really basic standard is called Cyber Essentials, uh, created by the UK government back in 2012, I think it was. Um, but it's actually quite, quite simple, quite straightforward to achieve. And it's a really good way of rubber stamping your approach to cybersecurity. And as you start maturing, you could look at something like ISO 27001, uh, which is you know, a more onerous standard to achieve. And what frameworks are, um, really briefly, are just that the, they are, as they su suggest, um, the name suggests, uh, a framework is a, is a kind of a set of guidelines that you follow and you can assess yourself against. And so there's a really famous uh, framework in cybersecurity called the NIST cybersecurity framework, developed by the UK, by the US government and large business over there, but it's now it's prevailing all over the world. And we use it an awful lot in our practice as well. But even if you're a small company, policies are really important. Even if you're just a guy, like a two or three person outfit, like you should have a policy around how you protect your endpoints with malware protection. You should have a policy for how you back up your data at the very minimum. Uh, Multi-factor and two-factor authentication, that's the MFA and 2FA piece. This is critical. <laughs> I, cannot, I cannot get across you how critical this is. This is an extra layer of protection. So anyone who's using a banking app these days will be aware of you get a code sent to your phone, you type in the code and off you go. 
So it's that extra layer of authentication. Um, you should have multi-factor, two-factor two -factor authentication on everything. Um, we use it across all devices. Uh, we use it on our PCs, uh, servers, everything. But for most people, I would absolutely recommend that you have it in, in place for your cloud solutions. So if you're using, let's say, Google Workplace, or if you're using Microsoft 365, which is what the two platforms that most people are using out there. If you're using Dropbox, if you're using any of these tools, make sure they're wrapped up in two-factor authentication. So that's just some of the terminology we're going to use as we go through. Um, just a quick survey, and what I'm looking for is I'm looking for hands here. We're just trying to get an assessment we've, uh, of how many people have had a direct experience from ransomware and malware. Um, it's completely anonymous, by the way, so you can put your hand up freely. And what I mean by direct experience, it's like either you've had a hit yourselves or you've had some kind of really suspicious behavior going on that you had to pull an expert in to sort out or wipe the machine for. So if we get a hands up on that, that'd be, be very useful. And what I'm looking for maybe Shima from you guys is if we can get, a, get a, some indication of what response number versus the number of people on the call. Um, like I say, feel free to just throw up your hands. I'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, Shima, do we have uh, some kind of uh, understanding of how many people there are there? There's still hands going up here. There are seven with raised hands seven. there, Mark. Yeah. Yeah, seven. Twelve in the chat. Okay, so, so we... fourteen, yes. Um yeah, so what we have so our experience of this when we when we put it out there is that and it's a question that was raised actually in in advance of the in advance of the presentation was like what kind of percentage of Irish SMEs are getting hit by this and our experience of it then by, by doing these events elsewhere is about 37%. So just shy of 40% of people are have experienced some 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 experience of ransomware malware in the last in the last 12 months. Now whether that was completely destructive or not is another thing. Uh, but it's it's a very high percentage. I mean it would have been half of that two years ago, maybe even less, 15% uh, two years ago. And it just shows you how how how, how prevalent it's becoming. And the second question is, has anyone been affected by financial fraud or invoice redirection? And what I mean by this is that's where, even if somebody has just approached you and said like, oh, the, our bank accounts have changed. Um, can you please set us up a, as a payee on this new bank account number? This is something that we have seen an unbelievable amount about, about three, three to four years ago. It's less prevalent now than it was a couple of years back. Um, but I see, I see, you know, what we're seeing now is I'm seeing five participants, five people here with their hands raised. And it, it's really, it's not uncommon uh, at all. Uh, the amount, and this, this is what we call spear phishing, it's where really targeted, really targeted approach to specific people. And they're scraping the details through LinkedIn, they're looking for the financial people, they're looking for the people below the head financial people to instruct them to do payments and stuff. And we've seen some, seen some really, really interesting um, and really professional um, types of emails, phishing, phishing emails in this. So we have six, six people with their hands raised there. So yet again, in this case here, normally it's about 20% uh, of, of people that we, that we see fall victim to this. And the last question is really the most important one of all, I think, which is how many of you out there today feel that you have the appropriate measures in place to both protect yourself and also to recover from, not just to protect yourself, but also to recover from a cybersecurity attack, such as a ransomware. So this one's really important. I mean, how, how prepared would you feel? Like if you got hit with a ransomware hit today, like what are the chances of you being able to fully recover from that in the next, let's say the next 24, 48 hours? And this is one is the telling one because the people who put their hands up, everyone else who doesn't put their hands up are the people who can't. And it's, uh, it tells us, uh, it tells us uh, where, where people are at. 
because this is the this is the bit that we're discussing here today. This is what we're after. Okay, we've got six people who have raised their hand. Maybe I've got the same six people. I'm not sure, but or seven, but that's a very low number against. Uh, it's, a, it's an extremely low number against uh, the number of people on the call today. Uh, so really, I think that brings us forward to to context and what's actually happening out there. So I'll just jump straight through the context here. Um, in simple terms, ransomware attacks are up about 600%, sixfold in the last 12 months alone, right? So that's, that's what we see out there. I've never, I'm in this business 25 years and I've seen a lot of stuff. Um, that my, my, my career in the cyberspace, I work in the kind of banking industry and in insurance and stuff like that back in the, uh, back in the late, uh, back in the early 90s, so there was at that point. So never in all my career have I seen the barrage and the just the acceleration of, of attacks that we've seen since lockdown, since COVID. And it really comes down, an awful lot of it comes down to the fact that the practices that protected you in your business haven't been extended to people as they went home, as they, as they went to work from home. So the controls that need to be in place weren't there. And an awful lot of the reason why these, these, these attacks are so successful is because they're, they're preying on people who are working on home devices and the likes. But I thought we'd take some real, real life examples here. I'll start at the bottom here in architectural practice. This is a, a really good friend of mine, someone I was, uh, I was in school with, uh, who has a practice in Manchester. And he called me up on a Monday morning at uh, half eight and said, uh, we've, all of our data is frappéed, it's gone. Um, we've got a, a ransom a demand to pay but they, they'd hit their their site over over a period of a weekend and um, they they encrypted absolutely everything they got the backups as well and those guys just had to pay out they wanted an initial ransom of about twenty five thousand sterling and they paid eight but they had no choice because all the data was gone and the second was the software platform this is used by a client of ours um, and it's yet again it's a uk-based company but they've got about 300 clients using it's a very specific solution um, uh, for, for, for data interchange and it's kind of like a CRM thing as well. But that was compromised by an RDP attack and they spent seven days down. They didn't have a proper recovery plan, which is why they were down for so long. But uh, the chances are that business will, will either die or it'll just re-emerge under, under a different brand. Um, but it, it goes to show that's just a lack of preparation there, both in terms of protection and in terms of recovery. And the final one, there's an engineering company, Irish company with 100 staff, uh, locations around the world. A ransomware got into a, a, an unsecured home user. So they got access to this person's PC and over a period of about two weeks, gradually got more and more information from that site and eventually brought the whole place down. And it cost them roughly about 450 grand to recover from that. So you can see different types of businesses. And what, I think one of the things I'd like to get across here today is that we still have clients, and I still have clients today who say, oh, well, they're not going to be interested in me because we've got nothing of interest to them. And it, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the cyber criminals don't care. It's a spray and pray type of operation. They, they spray the stuff out into the internet. They see what, they get, what hooks they get. And we're going to go through how they work next. But the reality is they'll go after anybody as long as they can get a, as long as they can get a ransom out of it. And it's just imperative really really important that you protect yourselves um, in any way that you can but you can see here about 12 15 100 staff it can affect three user staff i've, I've heard of a of a of a, a smokehouse out the west of ireland that got done for twenty five thousand euros on a, on a financial fraud thing about two years ago i mean they're just they're, they, they target everybody um so just you know it gives you an idea of the, the modern context um how hackers work Another question we get asked a lot. Um, so how does it happen? How do they get in to your network? Or how do they actually start the process? And it could be any, any number of things. Uh, it could be phishing. So phishing is like kind of targeted emails of web-based scams. So that could be stuff like, oh, your DVD package is about to arrive. You click on the link or you, you open up an attachment uh, unwittingly, of course, and it dumps something on your machine. It dumps malware, Trojan on your machine that then opens up the back door to the hackers and they get access to your PC. And from there, they go, they go everywhere. Um, direct hacking, it's, that's kind of misconfigured technology. And it's, it's not as common these days because it's harder. 
Uh, social engineering is huge. I don't know how many, I'd be interested to know, like almost everybody I know after the HSC event got a phone call from an, from, a, from an unnamed person saying, I'm from the HSC or I'm from the revenue. I've got your PPS number here and I want you to, we want to send some money back you. Can I get your bank account details, please? That's an example of social engineering. And it's been really pervasive. My own, my own, my own parents have had it done. Half of my family on, on my wife's side have had it done. It's, it's incredible. And hack credentials are another method. So hack credentials are where you use the same username and password, um, different services. So let's say you're a Garmin user or you're a LinkedIn user or Dropbox. Each of these platforms has been hacked over the last several years. And if you're using those same credentials to access, let's say your current email or your VPN to get access to your network, as an example. Um, those credentials can be used legitimately, I suppose. I mean, you know, nothing stops them from getting into your into into your into your services, like you might say Microsoft or in through your VPN into your office. So it's really a case of being careful, you know, like hack credentials. You can kill off the hack credentials problem through using multi-batch authentication, social engineering, being aware. Um, but once they're in, this is the critical piece. What do they do? Like once they're into your network, they can start gathering data about machines and users and passwords. And the really, the really nasty thing about this is that they use commonly used tools. And actually, there's nothing wrong with these tools. Like we use them as systems administrators, like our, our engineers would use them day, day to day. So they're not illegal. Uh, so they can harvest this information quite legally, or not legally, but they would appear to be legitimate on your network. Once they have, once they've got passwords and once they have access to that information, they can elevate their privileges. I had a really interesting uh, case about, probably, I think about two months ago, where we had a remote user uh, trying to get in, uh, and we're having there was some there was some kind of difficulty. They're having a persistent issue with the time of their PC. And we couldn't figure out what that was. Anyway. But what it was was an attacker trying to get, they were breaking something on that machine to harvest the, our administration passwords. And because we don't send those passwords, we don't type them, they're, they're sent to a, a secure code. Uh, they couldn't get access that way. So they kept on trying to break things on that guy's PC. And then what we discovered is this guy was using a home PC. Yeah, we, we, whipped him off the, uh, whip, we whipped him off the network and we put our tools, our security tools on it. And we found malware there. We found somebody present on his device. So it's really important that, uh, that uh, you know, if you see something unusual to, to, to escalate it to somebody. Um, they, tie, they try to elevate privileges. The thing of it this way, if someone has administered rights to a device, there's almost nothing that they can't do. Um, so I would say this as a matter of code priority, if you've got people in your network or you've got people in your organization using admin privileges to do their day-to-day -day work, knock it on the head, it is lethal. Uh, it is the greatest, uh, what we call a lateral vector. So if, you, if someone gets into your network and tries to spread malware, it is, it is, the, it is the quickest way they're going to get there. So remove administrative rights if at all possible. And um, what they do then is to try and kill security solutions. We've seen incidents where uh, malware protection gets removed and then they just run free. Uh, what we recommend is that if you are looking at malware protection, that you use A, a reputable vendor. Uh, but B, uh, that they have full tamper protection. Uh, and what I mean by tamper protection, I mean that nobody can remove it unless it's, there's a very specific process to do it uh, in a secure way. Um, and then what they do is they steal data. Uh, what's happening more and more these days is ransomware used to just be, they would encrypt everything. They would just nuke every, all data that, that was in its path and make it unreadable. And then they would say, we want X amount of money to give you the keys so you can decrypt it. Um, but what they've started doing now is they started stealing data in advance of that because more and more companies have cottoned onto the fact that, you know, we have a proper backup strategy and a proper, proper recovery strategy, right? So if you can recover, why would you pay them? Uh, but what they do now is they, they, they embed themselves on your servers for often a week or two weeks and they steal as much of your data as they can. And it's only then that they launch the attack and encrypt the stuff. So what they do is they say, okay, well, you know, you don't want to pay us, that's okay, but we're going to dump all of your intellectual property and all of your data onto the internet. And we're just going to stick it out in the dark web to the highest bidder. 
uh, and that's what happens. So you, you're really trying to stop all of these things from happening, but that is what does happen. So the harder you make it for them, uh, the more likely they are to move on to a simpler target because there are plenty of simple targets out there. So that's, that's how, the, the, how the hackers work. Um, it's not a pretty picture, uh, but I suppose what we're, what the, the purpose of this is to start talking about how we, how we stop that from happening. The one comment that uh, I had a conversation with, uh, with, uh, with someone in Price Waterhouse, we're doing an audit with, we're doing an audit with one of our clients recently. And he was saying, just from a supplier side perspective, just from the perspective of people in your network, people you do business with. So we all have an accountant, uh, we all have uh, a solicitor, et cetera, et cetera, uh, architects, whatever you deal with every day. But your clients and the people who use you believe you that they believe that you have this sorted. And um, certainly we verify this with all of our all of our suppliers. We, ver we go through a process of verification that you, you have all these controls in place because you're handling sensitive data that belongs to us. Um, but what I would ask you is like, would you bet your house that, that you have it sorted? And I think it's really critical that you you have you have that kind of thinking. Is like, no, I need to be able to, I need that certainty. I need to understand, I need to, I need to know that I have this boxed off and done right. So let's start talking about how you get. Get, get to that position. The six steps. So the first of the steps is to assess your current situation. It's like, a, consider it's like a medical, right? It's, it's that simple. You need to understand what you're trying to protect first and foremost. So you perform an assessment, right? Um, and the assessment should be like, if, if, you, if you guys don't know how to start this process, we've got a, we've got a sample assessment, it's in Excel, a self-scoring spreadsheet, uh, which we're going to, we'll have a link to it after the after the event. So you can do a simple self-assessment yourselves. But I've gone down to different types of businesses and sizes here. So if you're, let's say, less than 10 staff, perform the simple assessment that we've given you. It's, it's not 100%, but it is all the major things that you will need. And simple is fine. Um, I always think that when it comes to things like policies or assessments, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be complex. Simple is good enough to begin with because you can, you, can, you can mature over time and you can improve your position over time, no problem. If you're a 10 to 30 staff and you're in that kind of, in that kind of zone, look at something like Cyber Essentials. Um, you'll find that this is a UK based, um, in fact, if you work in the UK and you are a contractor or a subcontractor, on any government contract, you have to be cyber essential certified. And I think it's a real shame that the Irish government haven't adopted that as a, as a fundamental standard for all business. But for a couple of hundred euros, you can get this assessment done. You can self-assess, or else you can have an external assessor do it for you. Uh, but it's a really good thing to have because you can stick it up on your website after that as well. You can put it on all of your, on all of your marketing documentation. If you're 30 plus staff, you can look at Cyber Essentials Plus, you can look at NIST. Um, we'll talk, I won't talk much about these things, or ISO 27001. These are, these are much more onerous. NIST and ISO are much more onerous, much more detailed. Um, but you know, if, if you're that way inclined, and, and what we're seeing, particularly in professional services these days, we see a lot of law firms, and we see a lot of uh, software vendors in particular, guys with who are developing platforms and software are going towards ISO 27001. Because once they have it, uh, they have an awful lot less questions to ask whenever they're evaluated by, let's say, some of their larger clients. So more and more and more people are heading that way. And part of our business is that we were an ISO 27001 lead auditor. And we help people achieve that standard. But the first thing is to assess your situation. Where are you at? And the, what the assessment does is it gives you an action plan because it helps you identify where your critical risks are. Um, so let's just say for an example, that you don't have centralized malware protection and ransomware protection. Uh, or you've got, you know, you went to Harvey Norman and bought a whole load of different stuff and they've all, you're using different tools all over the place. That's a critical risk. You need something that is centralized that alerts you to the two to issues as they occur. And um, if you have no backup, that's a critical issue. If you have a backup that's never been tested, it's a critical issue, right? A backup that's never been tested is one that doesn't exist in my world. It has to be tested. Um, but once you go through the assessments, and some like you can start your assessment with as with as few as twenty or thirty questions, 
Um, and once you understand what the risk is against those, each one of those things, like I've said there about ransomware and so on and so forth, then you can start addressing them. You start thinking, well, okay, well, how am I going to handle that? And I know you're probably going to go, well, I don't know. I don't even know what tools are out there. We're going to give you some suggestions to what tools you might look at that are out there, tools that we would recommend or use ourselves. Um, or else get advice, you know, even if it's just one-off advice, get one-off advice from somebody who knows what they're talking about. Um, but you keep going till you get all your risks done. And the point I'm going to make about that keep keeping going is really simple. You can this is not, it is not a one-off event. Uh, cybersecurity is not a one-off thing. It's not something you do and move on and forget about. It's something you've got to have to build into the fabric of your business and how you do your business. No different than you would in terms of your financial management. Okay, so so that's just a, a, a kind of a, a screenshot of, of the assessment that we provided you with there. So you can see on the left-hand side, we've got critical stuff. You've got the different types of questions and the reason why we're asking. And then you can score yourself on a one to three basis, like one being, yeah, it's absolutely fine and perfect, and three being terrible. Um, so I think even if you self-assess using our basic assessment tool, it gives you, this gives you a starting point of, what, of, of how to identify the risks in your business. Uh, step three, education. Uh, educate the staff. And there's two parts to education. One is culture. Uh, and by culture, I mean traditionally, and what we've seen over and over and over again is that if somebody makes a mistake, somebody clicks on the wrong link and you know, is terrified of, of reporting it or saying something about it, you really need to get to that first. You need to encourage people to talk about stuff that they're seeing. Um, so like you know, the phishing emails, like uh, we want all your money. I'm not talking about the Nigerian man trying to offload you know, 200 million of, of bullion uh, if, you, if you hand him his bank account. I'm talking about much more, much more subtle uh, approaches that maybe appear to come from someone in, inside your organization to make a payment. It's really important that you get your people talking about those things and saying, I found it. And we, in, in our business, we gamify it, we, we, we reward it. And we give people cinema tickets or food ticket or tickets to whatever whatever the uh, the delivery or one of those types of uh, solutions. Um, train your staff. Uh, this can be a bit more challenging, but there are loads of tools out there these days. There's a really good Irish company called Cyber Risk Aware that do cybersecurity training, um, and it's a really good platform. Uh, it, it can be a little bit challenging to set up depending on on how many staff you have. But there are also free tools out there as well, you know, so like Cyber Risk Aware is a good tool. We use that for all of our clients uh, and it allows you to kind of establish a pattern, not only of education your staff and every new person gets education on the basics of cybersecurity. Um, but also what it does is it sends attempted phishing attempts. So you get these emails that are coming in, essentially attracting you to click through on links and stuff like that. And if you do click on them, then it brings you to the piece of education and saying, like, look, what you clicked here, what you missed was this. So it gives you kind of a real time feedback of mistakes that your staff might be making. And uh, there is a kind of a, a slightly horrific <laughs> um, statistic behind this. It really starts to have an effect after about the sixth or seventh attempt. So people will make the same mistake or roughly the same six, six or seven times before they really, it really comes home. Um, but there are platforms out there to help with that. And yet again, when I speak to, when I speak to other people in the business, they say if, if they could invest 100 euros in cybersecurity, 80, 90% of it would be in, would be in, in, in education. And if you think that 88% of all cyber attacks start with human error, it gives you a real indication of, of where the vector of attack is. Like it's, it is absolutely acute to human beings. Uh, step four, and this is the bit that I think most people focus upon. So, you know, I've got a problem. You hear about something like the HSC. Okay, grand, I, I need security. I need, <laughs> I need tools. I need something. I need this problem to go away. And uh, we often see, and this is not a small company thing. This is a large company thing too. We, are, we see large companies invest big money in tools that don't talk to each other. They, they kind of, they're trying to glue all this stuff together without first understanding the risks, without first doing a proper assessment first. So you can see that, the line of defense here. You start with assessing, understanding the risk. You start with engaging your people and getting them on board the process. You know, you can't do this thing without everyone being on board here. Top level management right down to the, to the most junior people in the organization. 
And it's really at this at that point that you start thinking, okay, well, now that we understand the risk, what technology do we need to deploy uh, to mitigate that risk or to, to defend ourselves against this? And I think malware and ransomware protection, there are different things. What you're going to hear, what you might hear out there is, okay, I've got malware protection, and then you've got different layers on top of that malware protection. So ransomware protection tends to be artificially intelligence-based um, it's looking for very specific types of activity, whereas malware protection traditionally is just looking for stuff that it recognizes from stuff that's seen before. And it's that marriage of the two that are really important. The one thing I'd say about ransomware protection, and it's really important that, uh, to memorize this one fact, is that good ransomware protection will allow you to roll back a ransomware hit. So it will recognize it. So imagine a ransomware hits and in, in, in milliseconds, it starts running through your network. Now, what you're, what you're trying to do, achieve is that the ransomware protection will stop that effect, will, will stop that infection, but then it allows it to roll backwards, it allows it to actually roll it fully back to, to, to restore to what it was before. And there are several tools out there. I mentioned some of them in, we use Sophos in our business, and that's one. And there's, there's, there's loads out there. There's Bitdefender, there's Kaspersky, there's, there's loads of different you know, solutions out there. Um, but you're really looking for something that covers the web, email, PC, smart devices, servers, the whole shooting match. You don't want one thing for the web and one thing for your PC, one thing for your smart devices. You really want to, to bring it under one hood so that any, any, any part of your network, whether it's your phone, whether it's your PC, any of these things at all, that they're, they're all covered and that you have one central point of, uh, of alerting and of management. And I'd say that more than anything else, invest in that. Uh, these days as well, there's additional services called Managed Threat Response, um, which is where you subscribe and the, 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 the guys who provide, let's say it's Kaspersky or Sophos or whoever, they provide a, a real-time response on your behalf. So they, they provide you with a kind of 24-7 cover. Something happens, they'll get on the phone, alert you and, and help you recover from a situation. So you can go that far with it. But at the very minimum, you need malware and ransomware protection. Uh, firewalls, 2P and 2FA VPNs for remote workers. If you've got a server or if you've got an infrastructure in-house, in other words, you've got an office and you've got, you've got servers and stuff in there, you're going to have a firewall and you're going to have people getting access to their resources in the office, whether it be file servers or they might be remoting into a PC uh, in the office. Uh, you need VPNs for that to work but you should really have two-factor authentication on your VPN because hacked credentials can allow attackers get in on your VPN credentials alone. Um, so having 2FA is really important on that. Identity protection for all of your cloud services, every single one of them. So using Dropbox, using whatever, um, all your Microsoft, all your Google stuff, all of, whatever services you're using. And that, like, even, like, even if you're a zero user or you're, whatever you're using for accounts, it doesn't make a difference what it is, lock everything up, have a, have a policy that says every service that our company uses is wrapped up in multi-factor authentication, every one of them, without exception. Um, it's, a, it's a huge backdoor and uh, you need to close it off. Um, backup and disaster recovery testing. <laughs> so having a backup is, is, in principle is critical, right? So if you've got servers, you have to have servers that are backed up. Uh, if you've got cloud services, your cloud services should be backed up, uh, or there should be some kind of strategy of recovery there, um, and you should test it. Uh, it doesn't take long to test this stuff. Like in, in our world, we, we, we test this stuff with all of our clients every quarter. We test the backups, whether they be cloud-based backups or internal-based backups, and we, we gather the proof and put it into a documentation. Because if you don't test it, it, it hasn't happened in our world. Uh, the final bit of the minimums are Windows patching. You probably hear out there, there was, uh, there, was, there was a really big, big attack uh, a couple of weeks back uh, on, on a managed service provider, but it came to, part of that attack was using print services, a, a weakness in print services. And Windows patching takes care of that stuff. So having a regular patching methodology is, uh, is useful. And good things to have are dark web monitoring. And what dark web monitoring does is it looks to see if your credentials have been stolen and where they've been stolen at in the dark web. And often when you put your details into a dark web monitor, it appears in multiple times up to about 2018 and less frequently after 2018, because there was a lot of big hacks before that. 
And by hacks, I mean things like there was a huge hack on Garmin, there was a huge hack on Yahoo, there was a huge one on Dropbox. And there's also, I would say, a large number of hacks that have happened in the meantime that haven't been exposed to us as the public yet, because obviously large companies are going to get fined at the wazoo. The GDPR is sort of 20 million or 4% of your annual turnover, whichever is highest. You know, nobody's put their hands up here, but it's good to know if your credentials are out there because it could be an early warning system for you to change your passwords. And real-time monitoring for breaches or, or strange behaviors. Um, I'm talking a SIM here, but what we call a SIM solution. But even if you're, even if you're centrally managed malware protection, uh, even if that is set up to send you an email to say, we have just spotted on one of your PCs in your office, and it's half six on a Sunday morning, which is when these things happen. Uh, we just spotted that one of those PCs it has been subject to an attack. Now, they may have been unsuccessful attacking that PC, but they might be successful attacking something else in your network. So, but you want to know that when that happens, um, or somebody managing your setup needs to know that that's happening. So implementing the right type of technology is critical, and, and these are minimum things for any small business, absolutely minimum. Um, step five, another question we get asked an awful lot about is uh, insurance and cyber liability insurance is the insurance we're talking about. And cyber liability insurance, I mean, it really, it, it's quite embryonic. Like we helped, um, we helped the guys in Hiscox um, write the policy uh, documents uh, or to reorganize them and write them a couple of years ago, probably about three and a half or four years ago, I think it was. Um, and back then it was quite basic. It was just, okay, well, you know, tick these boxes and you can get it. It's not that simple anymore. It's much harder to achieve, to get cyber liability insurance now than it was a few years ago because of all the attacks. But what it does provide you with is first party insurance. In other words, your own loss. That could be you know, business interruption, downtime, et cetera. But part of the magic of the cyber liability insurance is that it gives you direct access to legal advice with Arthur Anderson. It gives you direct access to top level PR device. This is 24 seven and full, um, full root cause analysis and remediation. So these things, like if you're a larger company with a, with a reputation to sustain and to, you, you don't want your reputation smirched by something like this, that's the kind of stuff that you need. So if you're that type of company, get it. <laughs> it's not wildly expensive, but one recommendation I would make is if you're getting cyber liability insurance, get it under the same hood, or get it from the same company that you get your PI insurance from. Because the last thing you want is one insurer saying, well, it's not, doesn't fall into our bucket, it's yours. And you get this kind of game of tennis going backwards and forwards. And unfortunately, we have seen it happen. So if you are looking at cyber, look at the cyber liability insurance, look at it through one, one house. It also covers for third party. Um, so anything that happens third party wise up to a certain limit. So you define what that limit is and that really drives the price of the cyber, the cyber liability insurance. But what it does give you is it gives you that professional root cause analysis, PO legal advice, all that stuff. And is it worth it? It's absolutely worth it. Like we, we have a policy in place um, for four and a half years, I think in our place. And we've got it at a very good price and they haven't bumped our price because we haven't had any significant incidents and we've got a lot of controls in place. But I think it is worth it depending on the type of business that you have. And I, I don't think you can understand if, if you get hit with ransomware and if you don't have the critical things, the critical bits in place. So let's just say you get hit with ransomware and it hits everything and because you don't have the controls to stop it. Like even we've seen a case of a, probably about three months ago where ransomware, the hackers got in, tried to run ransomware. They couldn't run it because they were, they were they had anti-ransomware solution in place, but they still vandalized the server. The servers still have to be recovered. So it's, it, you know, it's not that all these things will always work. So what cyber liability insurance does, it puts that cushion underneath you to capture, uh, you know, essentially to get you out of Dodge because it's extremely expensive and operationally very expensive, uh, particularly if you're working on a high transaction type of business. And the big caveat here is, but you need to have tools in place first. All the stuff we talked about above here, they will look for proof that it's in place before they give it to you or else you will sign off that it's in place. And if it happens, 
to you. They will look for evidence that they were in place. Uh, they will look for evidence. They will send in their people and find out whether the stuff was in place or not. So if you lie, uh, it's, it's over. So that's number five, ensure. Um, the, the last bit is, kind of, it seems probably a little bit simple, but it's to start improving. Um, what I'd say about this is, and this is the really challenging part, it's really easy to go out and buy an antivirus product. It's really easy to go out and buy a firewall. It's really easy to go out and do a lot of the technical stuff and pat somebody on the head and say, that was a great job. What's really difficult is to build um, some kind of improvement program into the culture of your business. It's really challenging. And I see it over and over and over again. People spend lots of money, stick it in a drawer, walk away from it. So defining policies and procedures is important, but living them is something completely different. You need to define what good looks like. Uh, policies help. So like I say, IT governance, there's whole books of policies up there from IT governance. Uh, they're a couple of hundred quid and you can get going with those. But you also need responsibility in the business. Who's going to do what and when they're gonna get it done by? So if we say, okay, well, we've, we've seen these four or five top critical risks Who's going to own that? Who's going to own the delivery of it? And who's going to own it from that point going forward? And then verifying that everything as it needs to be can be done in several different ways, but you should have some kind of real-time alerting. You should get an email or at, at the very minimum an email saying my backups are working. You should get, you know, if something goes wrong, you should get an email straight away. And then you should verify that, it's, that it, is, it, it is as it should be. So test the stuff and make sure it's, it is as you expect it to be. And it's challenging, like it's, depending on the size the type of business that you are, the size of business that you are, it can be really, really challenging to, to, to manage this stuff because you've got, you've got, you didn't set up business to manage IT or you didn't set up business to worry about cybersecurity risk, although it's probably in the back of your mind. Um, so you've got two options. You can either manage it by yourself and there are really good tools out there to help you do that. And I've, I've got some recommendations in the slideshow here, or else you can outsource it. And you can just go to a company that does that as uh, that's what they're professional at, or at least get some advice off those people. And that pretty much wraps up um, the presentation from, from my side. So I'll just uh, stop sharing my screen and hand back to, to the guys in Ismail. Thanks very much, Mark. That was Pleasure. very thorough. Um, really appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> As I mentioned actually at the start, um, there were some questions that were posted to us prior to the event. So we'll, we'll, we'll go through those. And in fact, you've covered some of them anyway, but there's no harm in just a recap anyway. Um, and there's a couple in the chat. And, and I, I will, if there are any questions that are nagging you at the moment, guys, those of you on the call here today, if you want to pop them in the chat, we'll cover them off in a few minutes. Um, so um, the first question, Mark, um, do you have a recommended application or text messenger for sensitive information? Um, yeah, it depends on the type of business. Uh, very much depends on the type of business you're in. So the, what I'd say, uh, Signal is what we use in our place. So if somebody, if we're sending somebody a secure document and we want to send the password, we use Signal. Uh, but if you're, let's say, in, in healthcare or in certain financial services businesses and so in legal too, there's there's very specific applications. Um, it, it, that, that tick the regulation boxes in each of those industries. You can just, just Google them. I, I, don't, I don't mean to, be, to push it out of the way, but Google them will, will, will bring you there. So it tends to be industry, industry led, uh, the, the, that, those kind of questions. But we use Signal in our place um, for interpersonal messaging. You know, we, we, we came off WhatsApp because of the, 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 uh, the Facebook. Super. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, now, you, you covered off the insurance just now, but um, uh, there, there was a question specifically asked, you know, what factors should you consider when determining whether or not cyber insurance is a benefit to your organization? Um, I think the first thing you need to understand is what is the cost of running a business every single day? What is the cost of not being able to conduct business? So. I'm working with a company at the moment too, who are who do about three transactions a year. <laughs> That's all they do. They, they, they do very big transactions, about 15, 20 people in here, and they, they just lead towards one of these big, three big transactions every year. And there's a lot of documentation bopping backwards and forwards. Those guys could probably work quite, quite happily offline for, 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 for a month, you know, you know, in, in around those. 
But if you've got a an, if you've got systems that are transactionally led, uh, and another client of ours does does kind of like you know old school text messaging stuff, but it's it's more complicated than that. But these guys do about 50, 50 60 thousand transactions an hour. Um, in a, in a situation like that, different cup of tea, right? So you need to understand what the costs of running the business are first and foremost. The second thing is like you need unless you can get these controls in place, you're not gonna you're not gonna avail of it to begin with. They won't give it to you. Uh, you, you might have got it three years ago, you won't get it now. Um, but I'm very much of the mind that if you can ensure, you know, a reasonable level of insurance. So like we, I think we only have, we, we have about 150,000 euros worth of cyber liability direct boom insurance. But th that's not the important bit to me at all because uh, I know that our recovery procedures work. The important bit to me is that uh, the advice that I'm going to get if I need, if, if I need it is going to be there quickly. So reputation, like if, you're, if you've got a business that has a really strong brand, it's completely a requirement. <laughs> You know, no, no two ways about it. Uh, and you know, the complexity of the business and stuff and how hard it is to get it back up and running again, that's all very costly. Because if you get a ransomware hit, right, I'm going to make it really clear about this. If you get hit by ransomware, you've got to rebuild everything. You can't leave anything in that network that's been touched by ransomware to stay. You have to rebuild it from the ground up. You can't just magically decrypt it. You've got to nuke it because those guys leave stuff behind them. So that rebuild cost is very expensive. Um, so you've got to factor those things in. So if you've got a large RT estate, then insure for more. Super. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Um, that the third question here, it's actually there's a couple of questions within the question. So I'll break it down into two, if that's OK, Mark. Um, what certification and training do you think is the most beneficial currently available for an executive working in a small business to attain? In order to, in order to fulfill the basic requirements of an officer looking to prepare a practice and enhance an existing role? Wow, I'd say, uh, can I hear that one more time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's so fine. I, think I, like that. I get it. I, I think what I'm hearing is like a, you've got somebody inside a business who, who maybe wants to take ownership of the cybersecurity management piece. Um, I think there's probably two parts of that, and the, 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 there are different disciplines. One, the one discipline is technical, which you know means that you know you come from the world of building technology solutions. Uh, that, that's years of experience to bring you to a point where you can comfortably manage that stuff. Comfortably manage, like four, three to five years minimum um, of experience in, in, in managing that space, probably with a degree in that and so on and so forth. Um, on the other side, there's the kind of more, and I think this is probably more pitched to the audience you have, is, is really understanding uh, and managing risk. So that we would call that compliance. So there's a, there's a very there's a very distinct route there called there's a there's a certificate called CISSP, CISSP, and that allows you to kind of build and manage a security framework. And um, so in other words, you kind of like as we were saying earlier on, identify the risks and do all that kind of stuff. And that's a really good approach because it's pretty rare for companies these days to try and manage their own cybersecurity because it's a twenty four seven uh, it's a twenty four seven event, right? So not many people are going to want to staff. 24 7. It's also extremely hard for SMEs to retain those skills. I think that's the important point there, Mark. I mean, we, we have people who look after the HR function within their SME, but they're Absolutely, not HR, yeah. they, they, they're not HR trained. So we provide training for that. So I think the question that was asked is very much around a small, you know, an SME, a small business. Mm -hmm. Someone has been given the hat to the security and risk hat to wear. What's the best training? I, I assume think, it's through somewhere, someone like our L D. Uh, training function where we will provide a an overarching view and then perhaps if there's demand there a deeper dive into security yeah, risk yeah. and protection yeah like there's 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 CompTIA like that there's there's industry-led stuff like CompTIA are, are a group that do CompTIA Security Plus that's really good gives you a good overall kind of education but I, I would I would suggest that it's much easier, much better. Um, we see this with a lot of IT managers as well. Like uh, IT managers don't get the funding because uh, I'm not given the, the, the money they need to address risk and stuff. I'd say teach people to identify the risk, put it on paper and then hand it back to senior management and say the risk is now yours, not mine. Yeah, that's, that's, the best, that's the best bit of education I can give you. Yeah, yeah, great stuff. Okay. Um, the uh, next question is, um, how secure slash safe is MSFT 
uh, I think that's Microsoft 365 standard versus enterprise for a non-technical admin slash okay. SME. Okay. Um, the, the, the main difference between standard and enterprise is the number of users. If you've got over 250 users, you have to use enterprise. You can use enterprise at lower end. So there's, you know, I won't go into mad detail here, but what I would suggest to you is if you're using business, uh, Microsoft Business, so standard is part of the business package. So Microsoft Business Standard, and then you've got Microsoft Business Premium. I would suggest that you go to premium. Okay. Uh, because in premium, you've got what's called advanced threat protection. And if you're using stuff like SharePoint, or if you, it, it protects the data as you send it up and down. And it also gives you in-tune capabilities, which allow you to manage your devices as well. So that I would absolutely steer towards that. And if you've got over 250 staff enterprises where you're going, E3 or E5. Yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah. Um, the next question is, and this is very relevant to us all working from home, but as a small business working from home, what security do I need in place to protect myself and client info on my laptop? Um, you, need, you, you need the tools we discussed above. So you need to patch your machines, you need to do all those things. So we discussed those above. They'll be in the, in the presentation. Uh, you need good ransomware protection and all that kind of stuff as well. Uh, what I would suggest to you is if you're holding client data, Sense the client data on your machines, I would really ask questions to why you're, why you're keeping it that way. If you're an accounting practice, let's say, and you're working with Sage or Taskbooks or one of those kind of things, and you're moving those files backwards and forwards, or if you're in pensions or something like that, and you're sending more payroll or whatever, uh, make sure that all those files are, are password protected and keep them for only as long as you need them. Uh, get rid of them as quickly as you can, or else find a more secure way of sharing. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, David's just popped into the chat there, so, which is relevant to this. So I'll ask this question because it's just in relation to what we're talking about. But for small remote workforce, is it safe to rely on the default endpoint policies in Microsoft in tune? On yeah. top of the other stuff like using VPN and training to mitigate social engineering. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's loads of great controls in Intune. You know, there's, you know, whether that be at the application side or whether that be the device management side. And uh, so, you know, without going into mad detail, like, you know, having device registration is a good thing. So that in other words, no device can get access to the resources unless it meets certain basic criteria uh, or that it's been registered to begin with. So that's a really simple way of, of, uh, of, of addressing risk. I would say if you're using VPNs, I would I'd really strongly suggest that uh, there's a 2FA on your VPN. So if you're using a Sonic or if you're using a Surface Box or FortiGate or whatever firewall you're using, these are generally the ones that SMEs use. And uh, make sure that you use 2FA on the VPNs. We've seen at least three attempts of attacks coming in with stolen credentials from home machines trying to get in on VPNs from all over the world. Like we saw one only about two weeks ago coming from Copenhagen, another one coming from Burma. You know, it's just you know, and Intune can give you that kind of capability, but you need to tweak it. And the only thing I'd say about Intune and any policy that affects end users, you need to you need to talk to your users about what you're doing. Uh, you know, communicate what you're doing first of all. Explain to them what the impact might be, and if you have an, if you have a problem, come back and talk to us about it. Don't push the policy before you talk to people first, because you'll you'll, you'll absolutely they will scramble left and right and try and use different ways of. They'll use different solutions, not the solutions you want them to use. So communicate for us, communicate the risk. Super, okay, thank you. Um, uh, for an SME, where is security easier to implement? In the companies on on premise, uh, sorry, on premise servers or in hosted cloud services? That's a good one, actually. Should yeah. the SMEs be fully in the cloud? Yeah, yeah, Ooh, this one's tough. Uh, I would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, is it a bias? It's a bias. Um, I say yes because the controls that you have, and what, what by controls I mean the, the 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 capabilities that you have in the cloud services are phenomenal. The problem is is that they don't come out of the box like that. So you need someone reasonably expert to say, okay, you know, like a really simple example is that when for people who use Teams out there. Uh, the logging behind Teams isn't turned on by default. The auditing in Teams isn't turned on by default. And more recently, about, about three months ago, they allowed guest access into Teams as part, just by default. Now, those things used to be on, they're not on anymore. <laughs> so you really need to define what good looks like first then, and, then, and, then, and then go with it. So as an example, let's say SharePoint is a file server. 
So rather than having a file server in-house, uh, which is a bit of a nightmare because if you've got people working remotely, they're coming in on a connection, um, they're accessing their files, and then they're emailing, doing whatever they're doing in there, and then the, the, the whole internet connection grinds to a halt because everyone's using it both ways. Whereas if it's in SharePoint, it's out, it's out, it's out and about. Um, if SharePoint, if you get, if your SharePoint gets hit by ransomware, you can right-click on the SharePoint object and recover it to two minutes ago or ten minutes ago or an hour ago. So. There's a lot of benefits there, but in order to make SharePoint work properly, you need to make sure that you need to, let's, let's just say in, in my example, in the example of our business, we mark all of our SharePoint sites as confidential. So at the most fundamental level, what we say is anything that's marked confidential is for our business use only, it doesn't go anywhere outside the business. And we have policies that make sure you can't send it anywhere, it stays within the business. And we've all the, and it gives us logging and everything else. That's all out of the box, and it's for nothing. If you if you pay for Microsoft Standard or three six five, it's for nothing. It's it's available to you. Yeah. So I would say yes, but you need to do it with a view of saying, okay, well, what advantages would I have by moving from here to there, and what security controls do I have here that I, that I didn't have inside? And also, I'm going to save a lot of money backing up the server in here too. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. Um, just so this is more on the sort of stats, but do you, do, do you have some accurate stats, Mark, uh, for the number of Irish organisations that have been victims of a successful cyber attack during 2020 or any other recent period? Yeah, I mean, we did some research in this a couple of months ago, and it's changed a little bit in the meantime. But four in ten was what we were hearing, and we've done we've done events like this for probably about 650 uh, companies, both here in the UK. And um, we got 37%, so it's quite very close by. Um, what I can't tell you, what I cannot tell you, is I can't tell you what, uh, the, the degree to which these companies were affected. So one person's PC, let's say somebody working at home, getting frappéed by ransomware or getting a virus or whatever, is very different to an entire organization getting taken out. But roughly speaking, four in 10 is what we're hearing. Uh, and That's very it, high, isn't it? it? Is, 40, yeah, no, 40%, it, so. Yeah, it, and when we did this, when we did the same kind of events two years ago, it was less than half of that. It was eighteen percent. Um, so, well, well, it's very hard to, to it's very hard to get the nuances in, in in this kind of environments. Like, you know, to what degree are we talking about interruption? Was it interruption or was it just a, an attempt? Well, that's what I can tell you. And maybe yeah. that four attempt is includes that. Okay. So that that's the those were the the, the pre sent a question so we're just moving to the chat here and in fact we you mentioned about monitoring dark web which is a bit of a spooky area for everyone uh <laughs> most people i think but karin said um you know is there a service for the dark web normal people wouldn't usually get into it or wouldn't wouldn't want to go anywhere near it but how do you monitor that there's uh there's there's free services out there um there's there's uh... I'll tell you what, for Karen, I, I, I'll put this in a response. The, the, the service that we use is a, from a company called ID Agent. Um, and these guys essentially go out into the dark web and they all these lists are for sale. So what they do is that they're essentially purchasing the lists are for sale and they, they, they gather them into their database and then they, they send you who's been affected. But you can test online yourself. And I, I know that Virus Total, I think, also have a, have a dark web monitoring capability. But there is a free solution. I just it escapes me right now. Okay. So you can go in and put in your domain name. You know, let's say your domain name. Let's say it's Isme. So you just put in at isme.ie, and it will tell you everything that's ever been been hacked. Uh, what what, what uh, ID Agent does? It also gives you the, it'll expose the passwords that are being used if it can, if it can. Uh, but it, it'll give you the passwords and the password hashes, which you can then go on to crack yourself. Okay. So you know, it just shows you how prevalent it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And uh, just on Windows patching that you were talking about, mentioned patching earlier, Mark. Um, uh, Evelyn uh, said, I'm not sure I understood what Windows patching is. Can you just give a quick explanation of that, please, Mark? Okay, yeah. So every Tuesday, Microsoft, and this is one example. So there, this happens in most software, but let's say we'll just take Microsoft for the moment. So Windows and Microsoft 365 and all that kind of stuff, anything Microsoft related. Every single Tuesday, they release Microsoft release vulnerabilities out onto the internet. Say like we, these are known issues with with our source code exploits or whatever the case may be, and they're released in tandem with the patches that are used to repair them. So most 
IT providers will give you a lot, will give you the capability or have the capability to patch your machines automatically. So they will apply those patches, those fixes to your operating systems on a time basis once a week or maybe more often than that, depending on how, 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 uh, how heavy they are. You can turn this on in, in if you've got a Windows 10 machine or a Windows 8 machine or whatever Windows machine you have, you can turn on automatic, automated updates. So that's really what we're talking about here. We're talking about the automated okay. updates. But we're talking about the centrally managed control of those. So if you have 150 machines, obviously, you can't just go out and get automated updates. It pushes them down for you and uh, manages the process by which they're deployed. And if you've got a small in, a small setup, um, you can either just turn on the Windows updates, um, but there's also another product. I think it's called Landguard, if I'm not mistaken. It's by, I'll put it up in the in the, in the the recommendations after as well. Sure. I've, seen, I've seen a guy in, in the States who manages about, 100 dentist practices using it. I was talking to him a couple of weeks ago and he says it's very, he's using it very successfully with the, the, I mean, these are no more than five or six users per place. Yeah, so it's basically when you when you log in in the morning and it says Windows is updating and it goes 30%, yeah, 40%. It's when, it's when you're about to do presentations, it's, 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 it's the machine's shutting down. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it always comes at a very useful time. Then. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Um, now, I think we've covered this one. It's from John, sort of talk about sort of the basic costs of setting, sorry, the costs of setting up basic controls that you listed. Have you got sort of indicative sort of, you know, if you're going to cover yourself from a basic perspective, indicative cost there, Mark? Um, for, for cybersecurity tools, it depends how far you go, but, you know, you, you should really be factored in probably no less than 15 or 20 euros per user per month. It's, okay, it's so not extortionate. And then, and then, as you as you start getting climbing up into the clouds, if you you know if you look at kind of real time alerting and stuff, multiples of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, so, but like fundamental controls, I mean, policy costs nothing. Yeah. The time to review and take policy costs nothing. The time to, to verify and test stuff isn't very onerous. It really isn't. It's just getting it set up right in the beginning that is is probably the costly part of it. But the tools aren't aren't, aren't wildly expensive. Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, Mark, the uh, actually, this is a good one. This, uh, uh, you know, uh, from Mike. Are password managers safe? I have over a hundred different passwords in. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this correctly, but Avast, A V A S T. Yeah. Um, but it worries me that there is a single master password, and I'm depending on no one hacking the Avast software. Yeah, yeah. But one of the big password houses was cracked recently. Uh, I think I can't. Was it because I'm not sure? I, I won't put a name out there because I'm I, I'm not sure. But it was. It was. It was compromised. And actually, it wasn't so much that that, that was compromised, but the, the the passwords that it was creating were so simple that they were crackable within a couple of mm -hmm. minutes. So yeah, uh, I'm with you. Like we we use password vaults uh, ourselves. We've got we we we've a, we've a vault for all that type of information. It's called it's called IT glue, but it's not, I've done it. It's not for 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 normal business, or it's really for our type of business. But uh, what I will say is that in the past I've used KeyPass very successfully with clients, and that's a hyper secure vault, uh, and it it doesn't suffer from the same problem that um, the Avast thing does because there's 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 a public and a private key. And you, the presence of that key has to be on the machine as well, as well as your password. So you would need both. Uh, okay. So there, there is more secure versions of, of the vast out there. Yeah, actually, um, Karin, who's who's on the call here, said, you know, that's a great question, Mike. I'm using, sorry, it's my front door. Uh, great question, Mike. I'm using KeyPass um, and wondering if that's secure. Yeah, KeyPass. We've used this, uh, I've used it with, um, we worked with the, with the with the marketing and web development task a couple of years ago, and we used it to exchange all that information, and that was very robust indeed. Yeah. Okay. Good. Sound good. Good. Good advice. Yeah. Um, okay. Next question um, from David: uh, For small remote workforce, is it safe to rely on the default? I think we may have just. Oh no, we we covered that one, didn't we? Because we were on topic. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, um, uh, from Dermot here, uh, great presentation, Mark. Thanks to all it is me. Thank you, Dermot. Uh, you're welcome. What is the best platform to run an ISMS for a small IT company? I've had a solution called Instant 27001 yeah. uh, recommended to me, uh, which is a space or on Confluence. Um, is that something you have come across previously, or could you recommend something yourself? Yeah, I mean... 
it really depends on, on you know, just to give some context here, the ISMS is, 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 is the entire picture of, of delivering ISO 27001. So it's, you know, the, through the seven stages. So Confluence is a, my, Confluence is a, is a content management system, web-based content management system, but will be structured in a way that helps with the documentation and the management of that documentation. So what you have in, in your ISMS is you have this kind of broader picture of what we want to achieve through, our, through, through ISO 27001, and then you have all these documents that link back into that. So managing that can be, can be challenging. Uh, yeah, I've seen different people do different things with this, uh, to be honest with you. Like an awful lot of the people we work with are just do it through basic SharePoint documentation within their own place or else. And I've got one client who uses Monday.com for it. Uh, and did, have done an extremely good job of it. Like they've, they've built out the structure in, in Monday, which is which is phenomenal. But you can buy in. Like there are there are tools out there. Um, I've, we've looked at two or three of them, and it, the the problem is is getting people to 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 agree that that's what they want to use. And that, like if, if this is just you doing it as a company, uh, you know maybe the confidence solution is right. What I would suggest you do there is just verify the controls. Like what kind of controls are there in Confluence? Do they are they ticking the boxes in terms of SOC compliance and in terms of ISO twenty seven thousand and one? What standards do they apply to data privacy? Um, how long do they retain data for? Um, you know, what's the what's the life cycle management look like? Okay. And, what is, and what does the backup look like as well? Because if it goes down and you're halfway, you're just about to have the first phase orders or your second phase orders, you know, it's not good timing. Okay. Very good. Well, Mark, that was the last question in the chat there. There's a lot of thanks coming in as well. So thank you guys. Oh, look, um, an absolute, it's yeah. been an absolute pleasure as always. And uh, listen, I'd like to thank everyone that attended. And, you know, like if there's any questions, burning questions that you want to pass back to Adam and the team there, feel free to ask them because we're always happy to, 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 to lend any advice that we can. That's great, Mark. Yeah, that 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 would be great. And what, what we'll do is everyone, there's a few people hopping off now because they've they've obviously got to go on to something else, but we will be providing the recording. Are you happy for your slides to go out to everyone as well, Mark? Oh, uh, yeah. So okay. we're we're providing we're providing a link for the for the assessments, some sample policies, and a few other bits and pieces. They can just they can get to our website. You can opt out, you can just grab them, then you can opt out of any further communication if you want. But we so send we send out relevant stuff normally every six to eight weeks. That's uh, okay, excellent. Mark, that's very generous of you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, we, it was great to be able to provide this, um, you know, free of charge. And I think it's a very important thing in in the in light of the HSE's um, hack as well. You know, it's become very, very, a very, very relevant topic. Um, and hackers uh, do not just go for big companies. They go for small oh. companies because they feel they're easy pickings. No, look, if, not, if nothing else, you know, if we... If, if people can put together, if they take their simple assessment and put together the controls of the simple assessment, and if, you know, you know, absolutely just, if you can do that, you're a large part of the way there. Like in the more, like the way we say in the, in the presentation, the more, difficult, the more difficult that you can make this for a hacker, the chances are they're going to move on somewhere else. Yeah. It's yeah. just that simple. Yeah. Um, so... Excellent. Okay. Well, Mark, thank you so much and really appreciate the free toolkits and assessment tools and everything yeah. that you're providing. That's fantastic. Um, lots of thank yous coming into the chat there. So you've, you've really hit, uh, hit the mark there with many people. So um, thank you to all who have joined us. Uh, we'll send them the recording out when we receive it from Zoom, which will be sometime this afternoon, and we'll attach the relevant documentation as well. Mark, thank you to you once again. Yeah, enjoy, uh, it was a pleasure. enjoy the see. weekend and sleep, sleep well. Remember your sunscreen. It's supposed yeah. to be hot. <laughs> Thanks very much, Take everyone. Take care now. See you. Bye-bye.